Coming up on 2020 on ID. They came to the diving wonder of the world, the Great Barrier Reef, and disappeared. There was a real possibility that they may still be alive. Abandoned by a diver, left out to drift in the shark-infested sea. You spend two days in the water and the tiger will eat you. Where are they? Every day passes, they're not found. Where are they? But was this an accident? Something was not right. We lost two people in perfect survival conditions and we've never found them. It's almost unbelievable. Did their diaries reveal a darker plan of suicide, even murder? Perhaps Tom sees the day. This is the opportunity that he'd been waiting for. In a final twist, the Lonergans are heard from again. It was a dying declaration. It was a message in a bottle. The mystery of a couple lost on the reef. Disappearance down under. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. If you're a diver, there's no destination more fabled, more desired than the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Queensland, Australia. But for one American couple, the dive they longed to make was the last dive of their lives. Eileen and Tom Lonergan's boat returned to shore without them, leaving them 38 nautical miles out at sea, alone on the reef. They were never seen again, leaving behind a mystery that's never been solved. What really happened to the Lonergans? Everyone had a theory. Shark attacks, a staged disappearance, suicide, even murder. In 2001, Robin Roberts first brought us the story of the Lonergans' last journey. Anyone that knew them knew how they loved the sea. Tom Lonergan wanted to study marine biology. His wife, Eileen, loved the passion they could share for exploring reef life and learning, always learning about the fish and coral. They were quiet together, studious, methodical in their living. But diving brought them together into a world that sparked a passion in them both. Eileen's mother recalls a letter about one dive in Fiji. And it was a dive to surpass all dives. They had seen, they had touched a whale. And she was sure that she and the whale had become one. They had looked each other in the eye. The date was July 14th, 1997. And Tom Lonigan wrote in his diary about the encounter. None of our other dives have been comparable. I just hope now that we haven't been spoiled by our first whale dive. So Tom is describing the same dive in his diary. And he said, it just can't get any better than this. Now I'm ready to die. Tom wrote, I feel as though my life is complete and I'm ready to die. However that sounds to someone else, it's what I feel in my heart. They had met on the campus of LSU in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, their hometown. Both were good students, and both joined the Air Force ROTC. She said she found a friend at school and, you know, somebody that she really liked. And actually, Tom's the only guy she ever dated. They were a match, and soon Eileen moved with Tom to Texas, where he completed a hitch with the Air Force as an engineer. At that time, we knew absolutely nothing about Tom, <laughs> because when Eileen said they were getting married, I said, would you mind telling me his last name? And was that unusual, or did that fit her character? It fit her character, to see. <laughs> she had focused, done what she wanted, got what she wanted, moving on. <laughs> they were married quietly, no family, and began a life together, a life that would soon take them overseas. Eileen had wanted to be in the Peace Corps since she was in third grade. So we figured that was one of those things that she would do. And in 1995, they did, moving to Fiji. For the next two years, they lived on a remote group of islands with little contact with the outside world. Kind of like living in the countryside. Every six weeks, the boat would come with food, mail, whatever. There was not a telephone. There was no electricity. It was very, very primitive. Co-worker Eddie Styes knew them well. Tom was very intense, and, and he needed to mellow out. Did you ever see them apart? 
Very seldom did I see them apart. She was his balance. She, she really did. I mean, when Tom would sort of get to the edge and Eileen would be there to kind of settle him down, and they worked together very well as a couple that way. Both Tom and Eileen spent their days working as teachers. As first grade through eighth grade. The kids in this class were too bad for me, so I handed all the classes over to Tom. But come on in. The students at the school were often difficult, and both Tom and Eileen often expressed their frustration with the work, but never with the islands or the sea. And there's the Pacific Ocean. And they dove as often as they could. It sustained them, this love of the sea, and their devotion to each other. As much as she loved him, he was completely devoted to her. He thought of her in reading his diaries as like a gift from God. Eileen playing in the water. What she meant to him and how she had guided him to, to what he was doing, how he would never have done the things that he was doing if it hadn't been for her. After three years' service in Fiji, Tom and Eileen Lonergan were ready to move on. While they both were uncertain about their futures, they wanted to travel and planned to dive their way around the world. They had this trip planned to, to the smallest detail. They knew who they were going to dive with, where they were going to dive, what they were going to see. Their first stop, Northern Queensland, Australia. This beautiful, an often remote stretch of coastline where roads are often impassable and the dense rainforest stretches for hundreds of miles, all framed by a rugged coastline of steep cliffs and tropical beaches. Beyond the surf, some 38 nautical miles further out to sea, ocean swells break over the diving wonder of the world, the Great Barrier Reef. Rising from the depths of the Coral Sea, one quarter mile wide, over 1,200 miles long. The Lonergans arrived in the port city of Cairns in mid-January of 1998. Traveling on a tight budget, they made their way to this hostel. Staying in this room, the so-called honeymoon suite. Today, Barry's speaking, going to walk a bit. Owner Barry Waymans. They kept to themselves to start with. Uh, very polite. They wanted to dive. That's all they wanted to do. And the weather conditions weren't uh, really favorable for that. January is rainy season here, where the tropical heat brings constant rain squalls, and the winds can keep the normally clear waters stirred up. The Lonergans joined a group of divers on a charter boat to the reef anyway, but the waters were murky. They went out on a boat a day trip off Cairns. Visibility wasn't the greatest. I don't believe they were overly happy with the conditions, hence not happy with the dive, but um, I don't think a lot of people were at that time of year. The rains and the winds continue to pound the coast of Queensland. Cyclones threatened to come ashore at any time, and the Lonergans chose to wait it out. It was obvious that they'd have to stay longer because the conditions weren't favorable, so they waited a few more days and then um, made that booking to dive off Port Douglas. Port Douglas, some 40 miles further north, and another resort town known for its spectacular access to the Barrier Reef. Every morning, rain or shine, the dive faithful walk down the gangways to their waiting dive boats, leaving their shoes and dockside baskets to be retrieved on their return. And then begins the hour or more run through the open sea to the reef some 38 nautical miles out. In Queensland, diving is big business, the most vital blood of the tourism industry supporting small dive operators and large ones capable of loading over 400 divers and snorkelers for the day's trip. It was Sunday morning, January 25th. The Lonigans traveled north in a bus that delivered them to this marina and the charter dive company, Outer Edge. It was a beautiful day, and they joined 24 other divers on the boat. One was recording the scene. 
Just going out with the outer edge boat here. Bunch of snorkelers on board and a handful of divers. As the outer edge powered out to sea, it was clear that this day was special. Blue sky, no wind, and on the reef, flat calm. The rarest and most perfect of dive conditions. These are the last known pictures of the Lonergans standing on the boat's bridge. They were heading for the best diving on one of the best reefs in the world. It would be a dive adventure from which they would never return. When we come back, the Lonergans vanish into thin air. And they said they had found some uh, belongings on the boat. A massive search begins, but can they still be rescued? I felt that there was, yeah, there was a real possibility that they, they may still be alive. Stay with us. Tom and Eileen Larnergan had two passions, their love for each other and their love for diving. They'd come to the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia to make a once-in-a-lifetime dive. On Sunday, January 25, 1998, they set out for the water. It was the last time they would ever be seen. Once again, here's Robin Roberts. 38 nautical miles at sea. Agincourt 3 was the name of the reef where the outer edge spent the day moving between three dive sites. It's a popular area marked on one end by the exposed rocks of St. Crispin's Reef and on the other by two permanent dive platforms used by the large dive operators. Lisa Simon was on board. The water was like glass. It was a hot, sunny day. There was no clouds, no rain. It was just glass the whole way out. It was perfect. For the first two dives of the day, the Lonergans had been the last out of the water. They were expert divers and knew how to conserve the air in their scuba tanks, stretching their dives to get every possible moment they could in their treasured underwater world. The last place we were at was basically called Fish City, where there was just thousands of fish. The Lonergans entered the water at 3 p.m. and chose to dive alone, away from the other divers and outer edge dive masters, including Carl Jezinowski. They asked specifically not to dive with the dive master, so they were diving on their own, which is cool. We had, I think it was a 25 or 30 minute time span in where everyone was going diving. They were told to be back by a certain time. Normal procedures required all divers to be logged in, dive times and depths recorded, and finally a head count to ensure that all are on board. The outer edge started her engines. <laughs> then we were just sitting back and relaxing and all, most of us were in awe of what we'd done that day. It was just amazing. But the Lonergans were not on board and no one noticed. Not the crew, not the fellow passengers. Their boat had departed and they were alone. Miles and miles at sea. The hours rolled by. They drifted. An hour and a half later, the outer edge was back in Port Douglas. On the dock, passengers collected their shoes. Two pairs were left behind, and no one, it seems, questioned why. A bag of the Lonergan's belongings had been left on the boat and soon found its way to the outer edge office. But divers leave things a lot on boats and collect them later. A bus operator expecting the Lonergan's for their drive back to Cairns called the outer edge office. Where are they? As night fell, there was no alarm. The Lonergan's drifted with the tides and currents in shark-infested seas. Were they alive, expecting the boat to return, fighting with fears of the darkness and the deep? No one, no one would notice they were gone for two days.
It was late Tuesday afternoon when employees of the Outer Edge opened the bag left behind by the Lonergans. They called Barry Waymans, the owner of the Walkabout Hostel in Cairns. And they said they had found some uh, belongings on the boat. Uh, I said, well, what day did they go out with you? He said, we took them out on Sunday. I said, this is Tuesday night. I'm deeming them as missing and ringing the police. It was nightfall. Rescue would have to wait until dawn. Detective Sergeant Paul Priest. The first light, there were 20 aircraft mobilized to search that area. 8,600 nautical square miles. I felt that there was, yeah, there was a real possibility that they, they may still be alive. Got airborne just after first light uh, that day. Searched around the fringes of the reef just in case uh, the Lonigans had managed to get themselves up on the reef and uh, out of the deep water. In Fort Douglas, police boarded the outer edge to begin their investigation. But essentially, it was about trying to establish why and how Thompson Island had been left on the reef. The Australian Navy sent a team of divers. Within hours, they loaded their gear and left the harbor. The outer edge sped back to the reef and anchored above Fish City, the dive site where the Lonigans were lost. The day was spent looking for evidence, looking for bodies. Nothing was found. Well, what's the likelihood of these two still being alive? We have extreme fears for their safety. I spoke to the US consulate in Sydney. Both parents have been notified. So we had just come back from church. Kathy was getting some supper. And uh, the phone rang, she answered it, and it was Matthew McKeever from the, the consulate in Sydney who was calling. And the more he talked, the less I could breathe, and finally I just couldn't breathe at all. I took the phone from her, and Matthew proceeded to tell me that they had, uh, they had been left out in the, on the Great Barrier Reef three days before, and uh, that we shouldn't get our hopes up. It was certainly frustrating from our point of view. Most people thought that the chances of finding anyone alive were very slim. They would have been gone by the, uh, dead by the time the search started. Port Douglas resident and tiger shark expert Ben Crop. I would not like to be out there for two nights. If you spend one hour in the water, a tiger's not going to eat you. You spend two days in the water and a tiger will eat you. As the story of the missing Lonergans exploded into world headlines, there still remained hope for their survival. In Baton Rouge, the Haynes family reached for their faith. Mostly, we're praying for the dive company, the people that seem to have left them behind. We don't really know exactly what happened to them. We don't see how God can refuse our prayers. He has them in his hands. Either he'll bring them back to us or he'll bring them to them, to him himself in heaven. In either way, joy will be found. And in Queensland, the press descended on the offices of the Outer Edge, demanding answers about the missing American divers. The spectacular news. Where are they? Is the question. Where are they? There's vessels going around that area every day. They're anchored there. There's huge boats going out with 400 people on board, nearby, to pontoons nearby. Where are they? Every day passes. They're not found. Where are they? When you come in again, 510, if you could go about 100... After four days of air and sea search, it is time to call it off. At times, when need to, there'll be sweeps made of the area. But at this stage, uh, there'll be no more continuous official search. The search was over, but the story wasn't. There was real concern in the dive industry that the headlines would hurt business. And there was a growing suspicion that the disappearance just didn't make sense. Dive Queensland Vice President, Carl McKenzie. The conditions initially were ideal. They just don't get better than that. There were boats all around where the Lonigans were. 
that bit of water out there, that's what it was like. It was as flat as that. Duncan <laughs> Fainchie was in a fishing boat on the same reef the night the Lonigans disappeared. And the boat was just sitting there like a rock, just sitting there, just not a, not a wave, not a ripple. There was like no other noise anywhere around, so yeah, if somebody yelled out help, you would have heard them for sure. We lost two people in perfectly survivable conditions and we've never found them. It's almost unbelievable. And that's one of the reasons why I don't believe the Lonigans are dead. The beaches along northern Queensland's rugged coastline are remote and the population sparse. So consider how extraordinary it would be that anything washing ashore would be found. That was about to happen and not just once. When we come back, the sea reveals its secrets. There was a flipper belonging to Arlene. There was a dive hood. But what did it all mean? There is a very good possibility that they have returned to shore. Stay with us. Tom and Eileen Lonigan had been missing for 10 days. The search had been called off and the dive industry was troubled. How could two divers just disappear without a trace? The mystery of the missing American divers was about to take a dramatic turn. With no bodies and the search called off, the police began to push the investigation into why this had happened. Detective Paul Priest. I still remain uncertain whether a head count was actually conducted, given the various conviction accounts, or again whether the head count was conducted but it was flawed. Wayne Brook remembers a head count. And they just counted heads. And so does Lisa Simon. We did a head count before we left the last dive site. Carl Jesenowski was a dive master on the boat. Everybody's talking about head count all the time, and I remember one being done, but whether they had or not, I'm not sure. Confusion and more confusion. How could two people be missed in such a small group? And then, just 10 days after the Lonigans disappeared, their dive gear began to wash ashore. On a remote beach some 70 kilometers north, Aboriginal natives had made a discovery. One was the buoyancy vest, which clearly belonged to Thomas Lonigan. There was a flipper belonging to Arlene, it had her name on it. There was a dive hood, also belonging to Arlene. There were two dive tanks. Arlene's basically also washed up with her name on it. All in the same place. All of it in perfect shape. No signs of shark attack. No teeth marks or tears. It was all unbuckled, deliberately taken off and discarded. The last thing a trained diver adrift at sea would ever do. Obviously we had to explore the reasons why they may have discarded um, these various items. And that question today, I suppose, still remains open. Evermore, the dive industry's suspicions deepen. The fact that it's been found on the shore would be a, a good reason to go looking for them on the shore. I haven't spoken to one single person in our industry, nor in fact one single person anywhere in Australia that believes the Lonigans are dead. Graham Conant is a dive operator and spokesman in Port Douglas. There is a very good possibility that they have returned to shore. Now, under their own means or with the help of somebody else, they've now escaped into Australia and may have even left Australia. Forget Hollywood. This story wins the award for mystery. Every day, a new story, a new theory. New claims they're alive. They centre around one of North Queensland's biggest tourism operators. A skipper with Quicksilver has told of a surplus headcount the day after the Lonigans disappeared. Had they swum the three miles of the Quicksilver pontoon, hid out overnight, and returned aboard a boat the next day? The returning boat had a headcount increased by three and reports of English being spoken in a party of Italian tourists. We explored that. Yeah, we explored that at length. That, uh, you know, perhaps they may have staged their disappearance. These things do happen. In fact, press reports seized on another case in New Zealand. Milton Harris had faked his death off a ferry in 1985. Harris was from Baton Rouge, the same town as the Lonergans. Incredibly, 
he was reported to be a member of the same church. And as the press reports about the Lonigans increased, the sightings began. There was no stopping. From the Northern Territories to the city of Melbourne in the South, there were reports filed with police. The Lonergans had been sighted 26 times in 26 places. In Port Douglas, Jeanette Brentnall, the owner of the Jungle Bookshop, says she thinks she sold them maps of the Northern Territories. At a post office in Melbourne, Rita Mason says a man matching Tom Lonergan's description asked about passports. Tallish and thinning hair on top, glasses, but they were like had that tinge of yellow through them. The press reported on every lead, no matter how absurd. Finding water by divine. Consider Bob Sheen, a diviner who claimed a talent for finding missing people. While interviewing him, one news crew thought they spotted the lost couple driving by and gave chase, finally pulling them over for this encounter. Oh, you look like the missing American divers. The Lonigans. These matters had to be investigated. We did investigate them and we discounted them as best we could. But despite police assurances, the debate over the Lonergan's disappearance raged on. We had the buoyancy uh, vest wash up on the same beach that the scuba tanks washed up on, the same beach that the, uh, that the fins washed up on. And any diver, anybody with anything to do with the marine industry would know that that's just not going to happen. I believe the Lonigans deliberately got into the water with the intent of staying there a long time. Despite the questions, police and the coroner's investigations continue to point to the same conclusion. Can you imagine the sort of elaborate plan that you need? I mean, there's far simpler and safer ways to stage your own disappearance than to get on a boat, jump in the sea, have some expectation that there's going to be a flawed head count, that you're going to be missed on the dive log, or you're in collaboration with the, with the skipper and crew of that vessel, or you've got a submarine somewhere in the neighbourhood. So it didn't take too much to realise that this wasn't a case of a stage disappearance. It's quite simply they'd been left to see whether they perished. Kathy and John Haynes traveled to Australia, arriving soon after the search for their daughter and son-in-law had been called off. When did you finally come to the realization that there was no longer hope, that they were not going to be found? I think being on the water, when we went to have a service for them on St. Crispin's Reef where they were left, and looking around, and realizing there was really nothing there. The Lord is king with majesty and robes. The Lord has robes. Since it was St. Crispin's Reef, the Lord uh, seemed like a holy place. So we went out, consecrated the place, put some flowers out, and said, This will be what we'll consider their resting place. It was the best we could do. It was soon after the Haynes family had committed Eileen and Tom Souls to rest on this reef that the stories swirling around their disappearance would become even more troubling. When we return, what the Lonergans left behind reveals a dark side no one suspected. I can only conclude that Tom sees the day. And Eileen's family confronts the unthinkable. All of this stuff about suicide, all of it's baloney. Then a final shocking discovery. It was, it was a dying declaration. It was a message in a bottle. Stay with us. Police investigators were narrowing their focus and the coroner was edging closer to issuing a report. It was expected that the Outer Edges captain would become the subject of a criminal prosecution. But there were still more turns in this case. None more upsetting those involved than what was to come. Police have just released a statement which says they have found in the belongings of the Lonigans evidence of, quote, trauma in their personal lives, unquote. 
When detectives had visited the walkabout hostel in Cairns where the Lonigans were staying, they took with them items left in the hostel's lock safe, their passports, their traveler's checks, and their diaries. Police explained if they had staged their disappearance, why would they leave their passports and cash behind? It didn't make sense. The diaries, however, would prove harder to explain. It was uh, a fairly bizarre twist from, from my point of view. They raised issues that I couldn't discount. Excerpts of the diaries were leaked to the press as the coroner's inquest continued and splashed across headlines. Tom Lonergan is quoted as writing five months earlier in Fiji, I feel as though my life is complete and I'm ready to die. As far as I can tell, from here my life can only get worse. It has peaked and it's all downhill from here until my funeral. Just two weeks before they disappeared, Eileen writes in her diary, Tom explained to me he is ready to die. He hopes to die a quick and fairly painless death and he hopes it happens soon. Later, she writes, addressing Tom directly, you have a death wish. I believe this wish may very well lead you to be in the right place at the right time to get what you want. I may get caught in that too, since we remain physically together so much of the time. It's a risk I take. I can only conclude that no accident took place there that would prevent them from surfacing. I can only conclude that something else happened and that perhaps Tom sees the day. This is the opportunity, as Eileen wrote, that he'd been waiting for. Police were sufficiently concerned to send investigators to Fiji to interview the Lonigan's co-workers about their character, including Eddie Styes. Uh, I was angry. I was very angry. The, the idea that, that they would even consider talking about a suicide pact, that just wasn't Tom and Eileen in any way, shape, or form. Back in Cairns, the coroner's inquest was taking testimony at the courthouse, and the press was swarming. The Haineses, Eileen's parents, and the Weirs, Tom Lonergan's sister and brother-in-law, had all come from the States. We're here to uh, hear the facts. It represents the Lonergan family. At the inquest, with family members listening, an attorney for the dive boat captain read multiple diary entries into the public record, suggesting there may have been suicide, even murder, at work here. The day that he read out of Eileen and Tom's diaries, I hated somebody. I mean, I just, I hated this man. It's so strange because we were able to sit through inquiries and through the entire trial and not really be as angry toward Jack Nairn, who was the skipper of the ship, as we were toward this man who was his attorney. All of this stuff about suicide and murder, uh, running away, you know, insurance, is it all of it's baloney? That was shocked. Absolutely shocked. An attorney for the families responded. This was a very, very hurtful thing to, to have been said about their children. That was deliberate, malicious misquoting. It was really sad. Of the diaries. And it was said it hurt a great deal. And I'm still struggling with that one. Both families have declined to make the diaries fully available for review. But in any context, Eileen's concern about what she termed Tom's continued death wish is clear. Her concern for herself is clear. However much weight I put to the, to the contents of the diary, I couldn't transpose those contents onto the facts known about their disappearance. And I wouldn't imagine for a moment that being, being abandoned at sea, surrounded by sharks in the heat and dehydrating is, is in any manner or form a, a quick and painless death. Nine months after their disappearance, with no bodies found and no direct evidence, the coroner's inquest pronounced Tom and Eileen Lonigan dead by drowning or shark attack. Still, the debate continued. I know it's troubling, but... The, the evidence, the hard evidence, points inevitably to the fact that they could not have uh, 
Sabah. John Bailey was a prosecutor in the coroner's office. It was his choice to recommend criminal prosecution for the boat's captain, Jack Nairn. I felt that there was uh, evidence that the uh, breach of duty was so great as to amount to gross negligence, not mere negligence, and thus uh, qualify as criminal, criminal negligence. It would take a year before Jack Nairn would be put on trial for criminal negligence in the deaths of Tom and Eileen Lonigan. And as the debate swirled around the case, there would be a final dramatic turn. The Lonigans would be heard from again. In July, some six months after Tom and Eileen disappeared in a remote mangrove swamp some 90 miles north, two fishermen had made a miraculous discovery. They had found a dive slate, and on it was written a faded message that they copied down in a notebook. To anyone that can help us, it said, we have been abandoned here on Agincourt Reef by the outer edge. Please help us or we will die. Tom and Eileen Lonergan, January 26th, 8 a.m. The Lonigans had fought to stay alive and survived that first night at sea. I was quite convinced that that was a genuine plea for help made by Thomas and Eileen, and in fact turned out probably to be a, a dying declaration, pointing the finger towards the outer edge. Well, it, it certainly was a turning point in the investigation, and that tended, in my view, to put paid to, to the notion that it may have been a, a murder-suicide. Forensic tests confirmed the slate's authenticity. It was, it was a dying declaration. It was a message in a bottle using diving equipment. That's what it signified to me, that these people were truly left 38 miles at sea and had written a plea for help at 8 o'clock the following morning. And had the search started earlier, we may well have not uh, ever needed an inquiry. The Lonergans had survived 17 hours at sea and still managed to write a plea for help. The believers of any murder-suicide theory suffered a setback. It seemed they had worked hard to survive. Now questions focus squarely on the conduct of the Outer Edge crew, and it was the captain's turn to take the stand. Stay with us. In November of 1999, more than a year after Tom and Eileen Lonergan disappeared on the Great Barrier Reef, the criminal trial of Captain Jack Nairn was about to begin. Once again, Robin Roberts. Facing charges of criminal negligence and a possible jail term of 20 years, Jack Nairn was now on trial for leaving the Lonergans on the reef. Journalist Robert Reed was in the courtroom. Jack still accepts responsibility. There's many things he could have done to, to try and dodge the issue, share the blame. Jack didn't do that. He told the truth, and the jury knew it. After two weeks of testimony, the jury found Jack Nairn not guilty of criminal charges. Just give us a break, guys. I, I just, it's best if he doesn't talk. He's, he's really quite upset. He came up and apologized uh, to me by saying he was, he was so sorry from the bottom of his heart. He was sorry. And we were face to face, and I just kind of gave him a hug and, and wished him luck because I knew that he still had a long, hard road ahead of him. Thank you for the support from all around the world. Thank you. Jack lost everything. Not only his business, everything he had financially, but he lost part of himself as well. As the Haynes exited the courthouse, they thanked the Australian legal system and expressed compassion for Jack Nairn. His life is never going to be the same. That's enough, guys. Come on, that's enough. He didn't have to go to jail for this to have changed his life. He's got to live with this for the rest of his life. 
The four crew members from the Outer Edge were never charged, but three are reported to have left the dive industry, and all have struggled with the events of that day. They've all accepted that they were on the boat, and they are shattered by it. They see it as a personal tragedy. I may never recover from it. May we grow in faith and holiness. Back home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, John and Kathy Haynes attend early mass every morning and have found solace in their congregation. Prayer is real. It's so uplifting. Your faith has really sustained you through this, hasn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. There would be no there would be no sustain if it wasn't for faith. In Australia, Jack Nairn was fined some $27,000 by the Workplace Health and Safety Department, and the dive industry has beefed up its safety procedures. Charter boats now require double signatures, one at the day start and one at the end, as well as multiple head counts and dive log entries, all to make sure this tragedy does not occur again. In Queensland, the Lonergan name will be remembered. I think it'll always be around. No bodies. And the questions remain. We still don't know what happened. Uh, all stories of that nature, with no ending, never go away. Since the Lonergan's disappearance in 1998, the Queensland government has enacted legislation to help ensure other divers will not suffer the same fate. These regulations are credited with saving others along the Great 